All right. Hey, everyone. It's Matt. I want to take some time today to talk a little bit about sampling distribution and also uh, the central limit theorem, the biggest theorem in statistics. Uh, so let's first talk a little bit about sampling. So, so far we've been dealing mostly with descriptive statistics and probability. So can you describe particular data that you have? Now it's time to try and do some inferring. So to take some kind of random sample of a population that we're interested in. Uh, maybe this big blob here is a population we're interested in. And investigate maybe some smaller sample. And then based on what we see in the sample, we can hopefully make some inferences back about the total population. So for example, you may be interested in all of the Canadians with diabetes. Uh, there's two and a half million thereabouts. Uh, it would be impractical to talk to them all uh, or to uh, survey them all, but maybe we could take a sample of a thousand that was hopefully a random sample. Maybe based on that sample, we could start to make some inferences back about the population. Now there's a number of different ways uh, well, there's a number of different samples you can get when you conduct this random sample. So if we have a population of size n, we know from our probability uh, that if we want to find a sample maybe of size little n, there are a number of ways this can be chosen. Uh, this will be n choose n. We know how to compute this. Uh, this is the number of ways we could choose a small sample of our large population. Of choosing a sample. of size n. Now if this is done randomly, uh, hopefully our sample will be representative. Although even if it is done randomly, uh, you can think about all the different samples you could potentially get. It's possible, although unlikely, that our sample might not be representative. So let's take a look at this uh, picture here. So this is just to give us a sense of what's coming up. So we have some big population P that we're looking at, and we can imagine taking one sample, uh, maybe these small dots here. We could also imagine taking a different sample, these kind of square dots here. And so these kinds of questions about uh, finding different samples will be interesting to us. Uh, it's important to go over a little bit of notation. Recall that we were using Greek letters for things having to do with the population. So size of the population is big N. We're using Greek letters like mu. Often mean is something we are interested in. Whereas for the sample, we will often use little n for size and our uh, familiar letters like x uh, here. So there's a number of things you could be interested in. You might be interested in the mean, median, mode, range, standard deviation for both the population and for the sample. Uh, standard deviation will be particularly important to us. Here it's written sigma x, sometimes you just write sigma. Uh, and we'll use s for the sample standard deviation. There is also the proportion, uh, p, which we haven't talked about so much, although this is uh, we can think about this as a proportion of a set that has a certain property. So you could say something like the proportion of uh, maybe set A whose favorite color is green. Uh, maybe you'd want to compare that to the proportion of set B or C uh, whose favorite color is green. Uh, so that we usually use P. Uh, sometimes we will use pi uh, for population, the Greek letter, uh, P hat for sample. Okay, 
So with that notation out of the way, we're going to get into talking about confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. Uh, regardless, uh, in all cases, uh, we think about desiring a large sample size. Uh, if we have a large sample size, this sample size is large, then this sample statistic we're hoping um, will be a reliable estimate for the population. So we may not have the actual mu here, but we may have our x bar, the average of the sample, and we'd like to know whether or not that is a good representation of the mean of the population. So we've got a few inferential activities that we might do. We might construct some kind of point estimate of population parameters. So this is like we've just said to sort of say I'd like to know about the mean of the population but I only know about the mean of the sample. Uh, the other, the next thing we could do is to think about confidence intervals. We could maybe try and put some bounds on what the mean of the population is to say I'm pretty sure it's between here and here. Uh, and finally we'll talk about hypothesis testing. This is a big unit for us. Uh, kind of a formal way to test some kind of scientific hypothesis you might have about the values of a particular parameter. Uh, now these sorts of things that we're going to be doing are only valid if we have uh, random samples. If our samples are chosen in a biased way, a lot of what we'll do will fall apart and it won't. Uh, we'll get results that don't make sense or are misleading. Uh, and if the sample size is too small, we may also have some problems too. So those are some things to be aware of. Okay, let's go and do an example now to see how this works. So let's consider here um, a population composed of digits of some phone numbers. Uh, so we have a bunch of students, they all have a phone number, their phone numbers have the last four digits. Let's say we take all of those digits together and just shuffle them up to give us basically just a population of 200 numbers between 0 and 9. Uh, this is actually some real data coming from uh, previous year's students and plotted here is the distribution of the digits in the phone number. Uh, this is the last four digits. So we've got a histogram here, it's a frequency histogram. And we can see that maybe we've got about 24 zeros, whereas maybe something like 28 sixes and maybe only 16 threes uh, that are popping up in these student numbers, or student, uh, yeah, digits of phone numbers. Now, let's imagine taking some samples of this population. So let's say this whole 200 here is our population, n equals 200. Let's imagine taking some small samples of 5 from this population here. Uh, so maybe just for example, you can imagine uh, we do this kind of randomly. x1 could be 2, x2 could be 0 x3, 7, x4, 2, and x5, 8. So I just randomly pulled these uh, earlier from the sample set. Uh, let's imagine trying to compute different things. So we could compute the sample mean, the x bar here. Uh, we can do that just by taking the average in our familiar way. Add up all the numbers, there's five of them in total. Uh, so that gives 19 over 5, or about 3.8. And uh, let's not do it by hand. Uh, we can throw these numbers into R and have it give us a standard deviation. It's about 3.49. Now, uh, the average here is about 3.8. Uh, is that going to be the average of the whole population? Well, maybe not. It looks like the average for the whole population might be uh, maybe closer to 5 or so, maybe 4 or 5. Uh, I guess 3.8 is maybe not bad, uh, but it might be a little off. We happens to get two twos this time, which might drag it down a little bit. 
Uh, and you can imagine that if you take a number of different samples, so we could sample in different ways, uh, at some point we may get some not representative samples. We might get three zeros and two ones. Uh, that would have a very low sample mean, which would be pretty far from our total population mean. Uh, so the X bars and the S's for the sample, they're going to be different depending on what sample we get. And so we'd like to make sense of how they're going to differ from the sample, uh, from the total population. So let's consider uh, this X bar here as a variable. Um, let's randomly choose five digit digits from this population a bunch of times. So we've done one sample already, we got one X bar. Let's do it again, get a different X bar, do it again, get a different X bar. Let's do that a hundred times and then uh, plot everything in a histogram and see what we get. So here is the histogram. Uh, we sampled uh, a number of times from this population. Uh, there's a name for this. This is called a sampling distribution. Sampling distribution. Uh, what does it mean to be a sampling distribution? Uh, so that's uh, it's the distribution of a sample statistic. So some sample statistic uh, like mean or standard deviation. We could imagine plotting the distribution based on a number of samples. So we take lots of samples. Uh, for example, it looks like we had about seven of the samples with uh, mean of somewhere around three. Uh, I should also mention these are classes here. These are ranges, so one to two, uh, two to three, three to four, etc. Uh, and we're plotting here the sample means, so the average that we get when we take the small sample of five. And you can see here that uh, the average uh, is maybe coming out to what we sort of thought it would be. By the way, the average of the total population was about 4.5 on the previous page, and it looks like the average of this distribution here is maybe zeroing in on about 4.5. Uh, and so even though sometimes we're pretty far off, so uh, there's a very small chance of getting uh, this very small mean and there's a small chance of getting this very large mean that are quite far away. Kind of on average or most of the time we're getting relatively close to the population mean. Now we were doing this with a pretty small sample of only five. Uh, there is a question, what if we take sort of a larger sample? Uh, so the larger the sample size, uh, what's going to happen is that the um, sample statistics are going to cluster around here the population mean and as the n gets larger and larger they will uh, cluster tighter and tighter. So this uh, graph here is going to show us a few examples of this. So here we have uh, the first column here, some kind of uniform uh, distribution here. This uh, it's a bit small. This is a sample size of only one. So we sampled all of the things from our population in just sample sizes of one. So this is actually just our population. It's a pretty uniform distribution. If we take sample sizes of maybe uh, five and then compute the average, the mean, and plot it, we get the following histogram, which is now starting to look pretty bell-shaped. Uh, it's looking pretty uh, normal for us here. We can continue, so here is sort of n equals 50. Uh, it's also looking pretty bell-shaped, but now tighter. And down here is n equals 500, uh, very tight around the mean for us here. So it looks like in the original distribution that maybe the average or mean is about here. And you can see that as 
we increase the sample size. The average of all of the sample statistics uh, is coming out to be about the mean of the population. And as we increase the sample size, they are clustering tighter and tighter around this value. Uh, this happens, interestingly enough, uh, regardless of what we started with. So here we started with a uniform distribution. If we start with a normal distribution, uh, it stays normal all throughout the process of increasing the sample size. Uh, however, it does get tighter and zero in on the average for us here. Uh, it even works if we run with something that's a bit skewed. So here we have this uh, very skewed distribution here. There's lots over here, but there's uh, a bunch of stuff skewing the mean over here. As we increase our sample size, you can see the next one is still pretty skewed, but it's looking a little more normal. Whereas with n equals 50, uh, it might be still slightly skewed, but it's looking quite normal. Uh, and then 500, uh, we are clustering very tightly around the average. So this uh, average here, was the average of the original distribution. Uh, the mean has been skewed a little bit to the right here. Uh, so let's just original population. So we started with something skewed, but then we took samples of larger and larger sizes and we got something that was bell-shaped clustering around the mean. Uh, this basically is what the central limit theorem says. Uh, so the theorem we're going to look at next is kind of well summarized by that example. So the central limit theorem uh, says the following. If we take uh, random samples of size n from a total population which has mean mu and sigma, then so long as n is big enough, the sampling distribution uh, of the sample means uh, looks like some normal distribution. So if we take a bunch of samples and we plot all of the means of the x bars, they will form a normal distribution and their own respective mean is going to look a lot like uh, the mean of the total population. So these are the sample means here. And this uh, interesting notation here, the mu x bar, mu x bar. So this mean the me this is the mean of the means, uh, the average of the sampling means. So you take a sample, you get its mean x bar, you do it again, you get another x bar, and you take the averages of, you take the average of all of those x bars to get mu x bar. That turns out to be the mu of the total population. Uh, we can do the same thing with the standard deviation, except uh, the theorem gives us a slightly different uh, looking formula here. This sigma x bar, uh, so that's the standard deviation of the sample means. So you can imagine finding a whole bunch of different sample means and then asking about their spread, finding their standard deviation. Uh, that turns out to look uh, a little bit like the standard deviation sigma of the whole population just divided by this uh, square root of n, the size of the sample. Uh, so that's what it says. We'll unpack it a little bit here. So 1, 2, and 3 basically repeats the theorem, but uh, with a little more detail. Uh, so one thing we said is the sample size increases, the distribution of the sample means uh, will approach a normal distribution. So their histogram of all the different x bars will look like a histogram. If the original population happens to be normal, uh, then the distribution of the sample means will be normal 
no matter what, if you start with normal, you end up with normal. However, if the population is greater than 30 or equal to 30 is also okay. Uh, in this case, as long as n is big enough, the distribution of the sample means will be normal regardless of what it looked like. So even if it was uniform to begin with, uh, after some uh, sampling of some large samples, it will start to look normal. So that's handy for us. Uh, the other, uh, it says two more things. One is that the mean of the sample means uh, will be equal to the mean of the population. So that's this equation here. Uh, and the standard deviation of the sample means uh, will approach this value uh, sigma over root n. This is our second formula here that the, for, uh, that the theorem gives to us. Uh, you may also hear this sigma x bar called standard error of the mean. Uh, that's a word that gets thrown around. So as n gets larger and larger, the approximation gets better and better. Uh, the uh, mu x bar will get closer and closer to mu, and the standard deviation here uh, will get better as well. Uh, so let's just record a couple of things uh, here in this table. So we've got population versus sample. We have our mu. Uh, this should be, oh, that's a typo here. This should be x bar. So we have the sample mean, x bar. We have uh, the population mean, mu. Uh, we have the standard deviation uh, for each uh, and the variance for each. So we've added kind of a few things here. So we have now the mean of the sample means. Uh, or sometimes called sampling distribution. So we now also have this mu x bar, which is the mean of the sample means. And we also have the standard deviation of the sample means. Uh, so that's sigma x bar. So you find all the sample means x bar, and you take their spread. Now, as long as n is large enough, uh, these two are going to work for us. Is large enough. OK, so we'll stop there. We'll get to use this theorem and these ideas a bunch in class. And we'll get to play around with some uh, actual populations and taking a bunch of samples.